currently the uh, Psych Sign Mentorship Chair on and a fourth year at Rocky Vista in Colorado. Um, I'm really excited to have everybody here. This is our first time uh, doing a panel like this. Um, and really we wanted to do it like this because CL is such a broad um, subspecialty. And uh, you know, we wanted to show you the different kind of career paths you can take. Um, so you know, I'm really excited for you all to meet all of our amazing panelists today. I think we're gonna have a really good talk and discussion. Um, and essentially how it's going to run today is I'm just going to give a quick overview of what, you know, CL is. I know that everybody's at different points in their uh, medical school years, so we're just going to do a quick rundown, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'm going to have all of our panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about um, their career, what led them to CL, and give really solid insight for us who are interested in psychiatry and CL. Um, so I'm going to quickly just share uh, my screen here so you guys can see uh, the PowerPoint. Um, everybody able to see that okay? Good, okay, cool. Um, so again, these are all our speakers, but you're going to be meeting them all uh, individually shortly. Um, so this is just quickly what is CL. Um, it was previously called psychosomatic medicine, but it changed in like 2017 to consultation liaison. You might still see it um, referred to as psychosomatic medicine in some places though. So just wanted to call that to everyone's attention. Um, but really I think what highlights uh, what it is day to day is this kind of italicized portion where you're caring for patients with psychiatric and general medical conditions. Um, so a lot of people who go into CL, I was certainly one of them. I thought I wanted to do internal medicine and I ended up falling in love with psychiatry. Um, and so this was really the perfect subspecialty for I think someone who's still really interested in uh, the more medicine physical aspect of things, but really wants to focus on the psychiatric aspect of things. Um, and I took this little kind of bullet point thing um, from the ACLP website that kind of highlights some bread and butter, you know, what you do day to day uh, if you're working in a hospital setting or other settings in CL. Um, so, you know, some common things you might see if you're in the hospital, like really no matter where you go is you're going to get consulted for things like delirium, right? There's so many different causes. Um, and investigating, that's a big one, um, you know, polypharmacy and um, drug drug interactions, um, evaluating uh, for capacity in patients is a big one, uh, catatonia is another big one, but it is really, really broad. Um, so, you know, these are things you'll always see, but like uh, on one of my CL rotations, I saw a, um, we got consulted actually by neurosurgery because they had a patient with um, excoriation disorder who was um, picking up their, their head and it ended up going down to the dura. So we were consulted as a CL team kind of to help manage the psychiatric aspect of what brought them to the hospital, but their primary team was neurosurgery. Um, so you see really unique cases um, and that's part of what I think is a lot of fun about it, um, but you can also uh, go outside of the hospital setting. So if you are more interested in an outpatient setting, um, that is something you can do as well. Um, and so here is kind of a list of different things that you might do. So again, that traditional inpatient consultation psychiatry where I'm talking about things like delirium and things like, um, you know, Catatonia, whatever, those are kind of more in the hospital settings. You're consulted by the medical team, but there are um, some CL psychiatrists who like to focus more on specific subjects. So there's transplant psychiatry. Uh, we have an HIV psychiatrist who's speaking later today. Those are kind of thought of as top within CL um, because they obviously have medical components to them, but they also have the psychiatric aspect. So like psycho-oncology, that's often an outpatient specialty. So it's really great. So if you want to focus on inpatient or outpatient, you can do both. You can do one or the other um, and get to kind of do it uh, however you want your career to look. Um, so with that, that's kind of just a quick overview. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to our first speaker, Dr. Zabinski. Thank you so much, Chalene. Thank you for inviting us um, and uh, helping to highlight this amazing specialty. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about my story and what it is that I really love about CL psychiatry. Um, I'm at Columbia on the consult service um, and I also work in the uh, faculty practice with uh, some interventional psychiatry uh, approaches like ketamine and TMS. So CL, one of the five ACGM accredited fellowships, one of the, the big ones. It's one of the uh, few that has a, a match for psychiatry fellowships. Um, and I, I can tell you a little bit about what drew me into it, uh, but first I'm gonna tell you my story. So 
I'm from Dayton, Ohio originally. Uh, I, I grew up there and then went to undergraduate at Case Western where I did a, a degree in biomedical engineering. And then you can see that there's a little bit of this, uh, I, I am interested in a broad array of things. I got a master's in social work and a master's in bioethics. And I think even from that time, you could see the sort of uh, germination of this idea that maybe I'll be a CL psychiatrist one day. When I was in uh, social work, I did evaluations at the, uh, the um, uh, Cleveland Clinic in transplant psychiatry, or rather tra the transplant service uh, but doing the psychosocial evaluations, working with the psychiatrist who was there. And then also at the AIDS Task Force of Greater Cleveland, doing case management with you know, medical case management, housing case management, and really starting to see that a lot of these things that impacted people's daily lives had to do both with their medical condition, their psych, uh, psychosocial sort of situation, and then all too often untreated psychiatric illness and the difficulty in accessing care and all of those things really kind of were the introduction to me in many ways to medicine, broadly speaking. No one in my family is in medicine. So this was a little bit of a unknown world to me beyond what you know from your pediatrician growing up. So I went back to Dayton, Ohio for medical school, Wright State University, um, and, uh, and had a great time there kind of preparing myself for this sort of clinical world. Although I had no idea that I wanted to be a psychiatrist, which Seems funny in retrospect, because I think it was sort of a, a natural progression of things. But I would like to lean mention so many people who go into CL have very broad interests, um, both within medicine, in my case, in medicine and in neurology. And it was a really difficult decision at the end um, and uh, some great mentorship in part, some people who were in CL uh, it really helped me kind of figure out what that right place would be for me. Um, I'm very grateful for that because I, I think I've landed in a, a very nice spot and I hope some of you will find that this is your best professional home too. So I went to residency at, at Johns Hopkins. One of the things that attracted me to that residency program was this really lovely blend of medicine and psychiatry, particularly in the intern year, really strong sort of medically focused intern year. One of my first rotations was in the cardiac ICU. And I, I still say sometimes it's just remarkable to me. One of the first orders I put in was for morphine in the ICU. Um, it's a, a, a memorable thing to put in an order. It's like after you've finished medical school, I always think when talking to a group like this, you're really close to that. So it's coming and it's soon. Um, but I had a really great time in, in residency. I was a, a chief in my final year. I was really trying to figure out what was the right area of psychiatry for me. I knew I wanted to be in academics, love teaching. I love this sort of, you know, being able to go to grand rounds and being at the cutting edge of things, just a very exciting environment for me. And, uh, and I thought through neuropsychiatry, geriatric psychiatry and CL psychiatry. I liked that the CL programs were accredited, had, had a, a more standardized approach to what you get in a fellowship. And I, I liked the breadth in CL a bit more than what I would have gotten in the geriatric uh, psychiatry fellowships, although I, I am very interested in the geriatric population too. So that was sort of my, my decision point. Um, and then I did my fellowship at NYU, which was, uh, again, I, I really appreciated the opportunities at that institution to be at a VA at the sort of legendary Bellevue Hospital and then at a, a private hospital also, the, the Tisch Hospital. So this split between these three places, seeing very different kinds of patient populations and pathology um, across, you know, like I said, the breadth of the specialty, like Talene highlighted, it really is, you know, from psycho-oncology to a, you know, an occasional very medically ill eating disorder, uh, a patient with an eating disorder, um, to patients with catatonia or complications, psychiatric uh, and behavioral complications from, Parkinson's disease or, or um, Huntington's or post-stroke. Um, so these are these were really interesting things to me. And I, I wanted to find a way to kind of capture that as I went into, into my career after I finished fellowship. I was uh, through luck and circumstance, it was the middle of the pandemic. Uh, there was a, an opportunity on the CL service at Columbia uh, where I could be on the general service as well as the, specifically the liaison to neurology. And I just want to mention the liaison component of consultation liaison psychiatry might be my favorite because you're not just working with the patient, you're working with the team, you're working with people across the hospital, ethics, legal, patient services, the, you know, the 
team member who's just been on a greater than 24 hour shift, who's just done their third admission and is really feeling overwhelmed by a situation. Sometimes you can be there and be the person who is able to, to help diffuse a situation or absorb some of those emotions. And you really lead to much better patient care. So I love that part and getting to know the teams on neurology has been a very meaningful part of what I've gotten to do. As I mentioned, I, I'm also in the faculty practice doing TMS and ketamine work. And I think that also is, is in another place to just highlight because of the breadth of this specialty, because of the expertise that you develop in thinking about all of these medical, uh, medical complaints that patients have, I think you're really well positioned to think about some of this future of psychiatry. What does that look like when you talk about VNS or deep brain stimulation or you know, advances in TMS, ketamine, psychedelics? These are areas where they're going to need to be thoughtful evaluation. I think CL psychiatrists may be the ones who are uh, best suited or at least very well suited to do that kind of work. Um, so I have a couple pictures that I just wanted to show um, if you could click. Uh, so the first one is just my uh, residency class. Uh, being in residency, you get really close with a small group of people as you're in intense situations. So I just wanted to, to share a picture all together. It was a really wonderful time. And then the next picture I have is, um, this is my first day of being an attending. So this, this uh, the, the feeling of like your first day of school, the first day of a rotation, I, I maybe it goes away in like 20 years or something. I don't know, but at least for me, it's so exciting to get in each day to work, to something new. Um, and so that was my first day. And then the last picture I have is uh, of me and my dog, a greater Swiss mountain dog, Augustus. So my husband and I live in Manhattan and uh, uh, with our dog and things have been really lovely here. So please be in touch if there's anything I can answer after this. I know we'll say this again at the end, but my email address is there. Thanks. And, and next is uh, Dr. Larkin Cow. Thanks so much. Um, really glad that all of you guys are taking some time on a Saturday to be here. Um, so my name is Larkin Cow. I'm an early career CL psychiatrist and I work at VA Boston. Um, this is my contact info and I'm similarly really happy to take any questions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so my journey started at University of California, San Francisco. I went to medical school straight out of college, and this is me at my white coat ceremony. And very similar to the two stories you've heard already, um, I was pretty set on being an internist in medical school. Um, and my early clinical experiences really um, kind of uh, supported that decision for me. Um, and I especially liked hospital medicine, doing that acute work. Um, and I was unfortunately pretty closed off to psychiatry. Um, I think I held some of the societal stigma viewing psychiatry as very separate from the rest of medicine in a way that did not appeal to me at all. Um, and so luckily I was randomly assigned to rotate on CL psychiatry in my third year. Um, I rotated not in San Francisco, but at one of our satellite sites in Fresno, which is in the middle of California on the map here. Um, we worked at a large state uh, or large county hospital consulting to ER, OB, surgery and medicine. And I found that much of what I had really enjoyed about hospital medicine, such as working on a team, seeing patients when they were very acutely ill, getting very cerebral about differential diagnoses and treatments, and really working with patients to see how they were coping with that experience of being acutely medically ill, all of those things were there. And something else that I noticed was that as a third year, I had had the opportunity on pretty much every rotation to sit with patients for lengthy amounts of time, um, really talk to them about their own psychological experience and existential experience of being ill. Um, but on CL psychiatry, I noticed that the fellows also had that time and so did the attendings. And I really, that really stood out to me. And all of those factors uh, made me really switch gears and consider psychiatry. Um, so by that fall, um, I was set on applying after doing a few sub eyes early on. Uh, next slide, please. And I matched at Boston Medical Center. So I moved across the country for residency. Um, very similar to Jeff, um, these, I wanted to include these pictures of my co-residents because um, first, these are some of my dearest friends and colleagues to this day. Um, but also, I think all of you have already realized that the supports you build inside and outside of medicine are so important to your work. Um, and when I was in your shoes as a student, people told me when considering specialties to consider three things the kind of patients you wanna work with, the kind of diseases you want to read about, and the kind of colleagues you want to be around all day. 
And for me in psychiatry, I really enjoyed all of the colleagues that I met throughout my training, but on CL, I felt the most at home. Um, and also, as Jeff said, that the, the team extends just beyond your psych colleagues, it's the whole hospital. Um, so I loved getting to know the nurses, physical therapists, residents and attendings on, on every service. Um, services that I really detested as a student. Um, I knew I wasn't gonna be a surgeon and I really suffered through those rotations, but I loved working with them when I didn't have to do the surgery. Um, and I found that as a resident, and I would just say it's even more augmented as an attending. Now that I've been at my hospital for about four years, you get to really build relationships with other physicians. Um, you walk down the hallway and people know who you are. And I think that as those relationships deepen, the more you can enhance your patient care as you work together. So at the end of residency, just wanna throw it out there. I know this might seem kind of far away for you guys listening, um, but I really wasn't thrilled at the prospect of doing a fifth year of fellowship. And I think this is a common story I hear from people. Um, and so luckily I did have some mentors who convinced me to do fellowship. Next slide, please. Um, and so I went across town for that fellowship at Brigham and Women's. This is me and my co-fellows and some of our mentors at graduation. Um, and as much as I may have thought at the beginning um, that fellowship was kind of a box to check um, to get a job, the kind of job that I wanted in CL, um, I really couldn't have been more wrong about that. Um, it was an incredibly transformative year. Um, I think that opportunity to see a high volume of complex clinical cases on CL with such close supervision is something that you kind of never get again in that concentrated manner in your career. Um, I met, I basically built a network of mentors that I think will accompany throughout my whole career, who advocate for me, who really still provide me close guidance now, although I don't work there anymore. Um, I also got to see things that I hadn't seen in residency. So I got to do heart and lung transplants, which hadn't been done at my residency hospitals. I was the burn trauma liaison and rotated in um, a GI psychiatry clinic, which just seemed interesting and new to me. And then I also elected a neuropsychiatry clinic because that was a weak spot of mine that I wanted to hone in on. Um, we also got to think with our mentors about higher level CL things like leadership or how to structure a service, how to build relationships with other parts of the hospital. Um, so all of it was really invaluable. Um, and I will also just say that it was not the same type of work as residency. It was a really intense year and compared to my friends who were rotated, who were doing fellowship in other areas of psychiatry, I do think I had longer hours and I worked a bit harder, um, but it was much easier to motivate when I knew that every case that I saw was going to be applicable to my everyday life. And, and it was also, we, most fellowships don't have um, overnight or weekend calls. So I just want to throw that out there. It's a busy year um, and I think everybody who's, who's done it will say that they would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, so if you're considering fellowship as the time comes, just to really consider that and talk it over with your mentors. I know that everybody's situation is different. Next slide, please. And so after fellowship, I went to the West Roxbury VA and that's where I work now. Um, I'm coming up on my four year anniversary there. And I had worked at this, this VA as a resident. So I was really familiar with the CL service. Um, I had loved it as a resident. I went back for a fourth year elective as well. Um, I love working at the VA, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, um, but just to um, throw that out there as well. Um, so I do general inpatient consults. Um, we also consult to the ER. And I would say that a lot of people go into CL wanting to do different things for different parts of the week. Um, as Jeff mentioned, kind of being able to um, be a part of various things. Um, and that's actually not my personality at all. I really wanted a place where I could have an office and hang up my white coat and go there every single day. And that's what I do. So just to say that a CL career can look like so many different things. It can look very consistent day to day, or it can look extremely different. And I think that's really nice about it that you can find what works for you. One of the favorite, th one of my favorite things about my job is working with trainees. So this is me with um, a former fellow of ours, who's now a director of a CL fellowship. Um, re we have residents from multiple programs. Uh, we have students, we have neurology residents and neuropsychiatry fellows who come through. Um, and this is really, I think, what gives me the most energy and joy in my work. Um, I am not intrinsically self-disciplined, so hearing questions from students helps me to stay on top of the most current literature. Um, and just building those relationships, I think, has been so valuable. And on, you know, on the hardest day of liaison work, I think it, um, it really pulls me through. So that's my, that's my favorite part about it. Next slide, please. Um, and just as I wrap up my intro, I wanted to say I love CL psychiatry and I, I love my job and that I found it. 
Um, and it's also never going to be the most important part of my life. Um, so I just want to mention this. Um, I don't think that work-life balance was always talked about in years past. Um, I got married as a fourth year resident and I had these identical twin boys as a second year attending. And I love getting to spend time with them. I love that CL allows me to be there for the bedtime routine, which is often in the somewhat early evening. Um, I love that I can go home from work and unless it's uh, the two weeks per year that I'm on call, I know my patients are safe and taken care of and I'm not getting calls about them. Um, I could take parental leave without signing out a panel of patients. Um, and all of those things have been fabulous. Um, I also wanna mention that the other part of work-life balance, I think there are the hours that you have, but there's, there's also a whole another um, dimension to it. And so it was phrased to me that your family cares what hour you come home from work, but they also care what mood you're in. And so even during the long days of fellowship or at the peak of the COVID pandemic, um, when we felt like we were kind of right in the heart of things, um, CL is really a job that I find gives me joy and energy and helps me to grow as a person every day um, for my work, for my life at work and outside of work. And so I hope that each of you finds that for yourself, you know, whatever it may look like. I would just encourage you to find mentors who, with whom you can talk about all of your values, um, including work and life outside of work. So thanks so much for your attention. Um, and I am happy to pass it on to Dr. Rosinski. Thank you so much, Larkin. My name's Amy Rosinski and I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan right now. Um, and I'm actually in my office because my computer at home is not the best. <laughs> so you can see some of my office furniture here at University of Michigan. Um, so I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and I'm kind of a lifer. So I've been here for, for quite a while. Um, so my story, um, if you want to do go to the next slide, please. So you can tell how old I am. <laughs> I'm older probably than some of the other panelists here by this picture um, that was taken in the 1970s. Um, so that is me kind of knowing that I wanted to be a doctor from, I don't know, I think I really knew at that age, at age three, I think I'm three years old here in the 1970s. Um, but I'd always enjoyed kind of practicing with uh, my Fisher-Price stethoscope set and, and knowing I wanted to be um, a doctor, my parents always said from a young age. Um, but I, I think uh, I, I ended up going to college at the University of Notre Dame, and you can advance to the next slide. Um, so I ended up going to the um, University of Notre Dame for my undergraduate, uh, and I knew even then that I wanted to be a doctor, um, but uh, I had a lot of kind of family pressure. So, I mean, I was, this was in the 1990s that I went to college. Um, and my father, who I'm pictured with there in the lower right corner, um, that's a picture actually of us at my junior uh, banquet at University of Notre Dame. So there was a lot of stigma. I know Jeff, uh, I think actually um, Larkin, you spoke a little bit to this as well um, about stigma, right? So, so my family background was that my uh, parental side, you know, were fairly against psychiatry. Um, so I felt a lot of pressure um, in undergraduate. I kind of knew I wanted to go to med school and was thinking about the what field. And I actually was interested in psychology and psychiatry, even in high school. I took a high school class and it had a high school teacher that was wonderful and got me interested in psychology. And I was thinking, hey, Dr. Mr. Jones, like I'm interested in psychology, uh, but I want to be a doctor. And he said, well, there's this thing called psychiatry. Um, and a lot of you here already kind of know and you're interested in psychiatry, but some of you here on this panel may be still trying to figure out what you want to go into. Um, but I think because of the family pressure, I was trying to think of other things like maybe, you know, pediatrics or, or other fields. Um, and I was trying, I think, to please my family in some way. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be accepted to the University of Michigan for uh, medical school. And I matriculated here in the 1990s, um, in the late 1990s and um, went through my first year and was kind of thinking maybe, you know, I can make pediatrics work and, and you know, that was or internal medicine. And so similar to Larkin, um, I really was interested and drawn to internal medicine. Um, but in my second year, so before doing the clinical clerkships, 
Um, my father, whose picture below, became ill and he suffered from endocarditis and he was helicoptered from a, another town in Michigan to our hospital. And I would try to go to lectures during the day and then um, go to my father's bedside in the intensive care unit and um, my mom and visit him and my mom who came in to kind of be with him and he was critically ill. Um, and it was interesting because we had a lot of specialists um, from other fields come into his bedside to uh, consult on him. So we had rheumatology, infectious disease, GI liver, uh, hematology. He was just very, very sick. And so um, I had a lot of exposure at that point in my preclinical years to all these different specialties um, and people being in the ICU. And I recognize now going back that my father was delirious. Um, so he, he really had altered mental status and, and was very, um, the, you know, he was delirious. So we weren't able to really communicate with him. But I really felt a strong draw to all of these different, you know, medical specialties. Um, and unfortunately, when I was a second year uh, medical student, he, he, despite having surgery, my father um, did not survive. So he passed away in um, the hospital that I'm sitting in right now. Um, and I think... Then when I went on, I took a little bit of time off to go to his, his funeral, um, and I went to the, uh, I started my clerkships then two or three months later, um, and I really found myself drawn to the psychosocial aspects of patients' illness, um, but at the same time, I also really enjoyed, again, my internal medicine rotations. Um, and then I was fortunate enough for my psychiatry rotation to rotate um, similar to some of our other panelists. I rotated on the consult service, um, I think as Talene did on, on my fourth uh, or my third year clerkships, I rotated on the consult service um, at our hospital and really um, found that invigorating because I, I got to take care of patients who were critically ill, but I got to focus on the psychosocial aspects of their illness and trying to help their families understand their delirium or you know, help them as they're going through severe depression related to their critical illness. Um, and that really resonated with me because I saw all of that you know, in my father's illness. So uh, sadly too, I think in some odd way, my father's passing, um, you know, it removed some of the pressure on me to not go into psychiatry. And I really think honestly now today, he would be very proud of me and happy that I chose the field that I did and what I loved. And, and I think when you choose something that you love and are passionate about, you're going to do a good job. You know, you're gonna shine um, and you're gonna be fulfilled. So, I mean, I think for all of those reasons, he would be really proud of the physician that I am today. Um, so, so I ended up then deciding um, after his passing in my second year and then after rotating, rotating on seal psychiatry and then loving internal medicine um, and saying, well, hey, I can combine my love for internal medicine and psychiatry at the same time, um, I decided to go into psychiatry. I chose to stay in Michigan um, partly because my mother uh, was a widow and I'm an only child and so I wanted to be close um, to my mother. So I stayed here in Michigan and I also felt a very strong draw to this hospital for having taken care of my father and taking care of, I have um, several generations of family who've been taken care of at this hospital, this tertiary academic center. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we do here. So, uh, so I, I did my residency I, uh, here at the University of Michigan and had wonderful experiences. The CL service, I think, um, was busy. And at times I was wondering, you know, do I want to do this for fellowship? But as I went on and, and did my outpatient rotations in psychiatry, um, I found them very interesting and I loved the continuity of care with patients that you get in outpatient and some of you may really be drawn to that, but you can get that in consult liaison as well, doing more outpatient consult liaison. Um, but I found myself kind of similar to Larkin drawn to like the inpatient team and having a team around me and the excitement of inpatient work. Um, some of the higher acuity patients, because again, it I think partly it reminded me of my dad and how much benefit my mom and I got from all of these physicians that saw him in the hospital. So I, I ultimately um, decided to, to do CL psychiatry and I, I haven't really looked back. I did the fellowship here. I was the first fellow in our program many <laughs> years ago. Um, and then I was fortunate enough that they had a job opening. So I was able to work on the same service that I you know, had done as a fourth year medical student. 
and I am a full-time faculty member on that service, on the inpatient consult service. I briefly did a few years of psych oncology, which was also really gratifying. So um, for those of you that are interested in that, um, that's a great field as well. But I, I, I similar to um, Jeff and Larkin, I do a variety of inpatient consults. I see delirium. I see patients who um, are depressed and suffer from suffering from their critical illness, um, eating disorders. Um, we treat we do ECT um, on the medical floors. So that's been really gratifying as well to see people with psychotic depression and catatonia get better from ECT. Um, ECT is hard to offer. And many places in Michigan do not offer it. So we're one of the few places. Um, and then in this last year, uh, I think now I'm no longer early career. I am more a mid-career psychiatrist, which is shocking, but I was asked to become the fellowship director. And that's been a a joy of a new career path to learn. Um, I have so much time at this institution and I have so many connections with so many people that it's been very gratifying to leverage some of those relationships and, and use that to teach our fellow. And I've been learning about graduate medical education and what the rules are for fellowship and how to make sure our fellows are trained to be the best CL psychiatrists they can possibly be. Um, you know, learning how to you know, give lectures and how to improve teaching in, in um, for our fellow. So that's where I am now as I'm doing both inpatient consultation liaison work and I am the fellowship director um, for the University of Michigan. I don't know that I'll leave. I mean, I think I feel partly my dad's spirit here. Um, and so I'm very, again, proud to work here. And I know, you know, he would be proud of me. And I think that's one of my take home points to all of you is that, you know, if some of you are still waffling about do I, you know, do psychiatry? Do I do internal medicine, what is my family going to think? Are people going to say I'm not a real doctor? I mean, please pick what you're passionate about. Um, I have never regretted it for one iota of a minute choosing psychiatry. We really get to make a huge difference in patients' lives. And in consult psychiatry, we really make it, get to make a huge difference in people's lives um, who are very medically ill. And, and I think we're some of the people that give the most comfort to patients when they're suffering, either in the hospital or outside of the hospital. Um, so that's my, uh, that is my uh, discussion, and I'm happy to turn the panel over now to one of our former fellows and now one of my colleagues in CL Psychiatry, Dr. Kamalika Roy. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that's, the, that's the best thing to happen. I feel so proud that um, I, trained, uh, I trained under you, and today I'm kind of the pan panelist with you. So that, that gives me a lot of pleasure just to be here um, with everybody, but especially with you. Uh, so I'm Kamalika. Uh, currently, I'm a clinical assistant professor at uh, University of Washington, Seattle. And I joined University of Washington just last year. Earlier, uh, I was a faculty clinical assistant professor at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. So I moved from Oregon to Washington, a little bit of move. Um, so in regards to my story, um, I think I'm the only international medical graduate on this panel. So I uh, was born, I grew up in India. My story is a little bit different um, from everybody else on the panel just because I had to move a country and a continent in the process of practicing and becoming a faculty. So uh, uh, like Amy, I always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, that was more like an organic choice for me. Um, didn't come from a family pressure or anything else. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, um, but then after finishing my medical school in India, I did a couple of years of training in anesthesiology. And in India, the system is a little different than what we do here. Uh, so we have a common entrance test after medical school and the entrance algorithm actually chooses which specialty you are going to go. They give you a couple of options, but then also you cannot just be a gynecologist unless the algorithm chooses you to be one. You can try next time, but um, I happen to get the options between internal medicine and anesthesiology and opted for anesthesiology. Soon after two years, I kind of realized that that probably is not my passion. Uh, I was bored doing anesthesia. Um, 
in in the ORs and kind of with the long schedules and um, less interaction with patients, less meaningful interaction with patients. So I decided to do something different. I never had a plan to come to this country, but when I decided not to be an anesthesiologist anymore, then I started looking into other possibilities. While doing that, um, I ended up applying for, I don't know, so thinking I was pretty lost, I believe, uh, looking back, but I ended up applying to a few research assistantship positions and research fellowship positions, and I got uh, an opportunity to uh, do a clinical research fellowship under Dr. Barry Riesberg in his lab at NYU. So that, I think, was the turning point for me to go into psychiatry. It was a choice by serendipity, but it was the most transformative and um, the best thing that happened in terms of my personal growth. So I worked in this lab um, and the project I worked on focused on a subject of cognitive impairment um, and the use of uh, factors that help uh, something called blend and brain derived natriuretic factor, BDNF. So doing that project and working with Dr. Risberg, who is a geriatric psychiatrist, um, specializes in Alzheimer's disease, I really got interested into uh, psychiatry. And then um, I did my residency in Wayne State University, Detroit. Um, and then uh, when I was a PGY2, my program director um, encouraged me to join a CLP. Um, at that time, it was called Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, I think, APM. Yeah, and so I joined SCLP, and then I started networking with a lot of um, uh, CL uh, physicians, um, like uh, Ho Chang Benjamin Lee, uh, who was one of my very early mentors, or uh, who actually taught me a lot in terms of what is CL psychiatry like this. We didn't have this kind of platform back then. But I did get very involved in field psychiatry work. And then the choice of doing fellowship was very natural for me. Um, after joining SCLP, after getting involved in all the field psychiatry related work that happens in SCLP, it was pretty clear in my mind that I wanted to do a CL fellowship. So um, in terms of fellowship, as uh, Amy said, I did it in University of Michigan, I was very, uh, fortunate to uh, train under Amy and my program director at that time used to be Dr. Michelle Riva. And she had a very long lasting influence in my career choices in um, who I am and what I want to do or how I want to practice and all of that. So she uh, practiced psych oncology and she was a program director for I don't know how many years, maybe Amy knows it better, but she was there for a very long time until last year. So uh, I trained very well uh, in the University of Michigan and I would say it was a much needed consolidation of all my training and it really helped me in my decision making in my personal growth and in deciding what I want to do and also what I don't want to do. So SEAL Fellowship basically, uh, looking back, if I have to do it again, I would do it again at University of Michigan. So the training was so solid and so fulfilling there. I did get an opportunity to train in different areas of SEAL psychiatry that also included um, uh, palliative care rotation and also uh, ECT rotation um, along with all other traditional inpatient models, psychooncology, transplant, I also got a chance to work um, in a PNES rotation, psychogenic non-epileptic seizure disorder rotation. So those were some unique aspects that really trained me so well that by the end of the fellowship, I was ready to take on anything that comes my way. But I did have a wide variety of options to choose from, and I ended up... Um, coming to OHSU at that point, because that seemed like the best decision in terms of balancing a work and life and also location. Location had a really big um, uh, 
kind of, uh, it was a really big factor in my decision making at that point, and it still is. I love Pacific Northwest. I love uh, everything that happens here and all the opportunities I get um, here. So I decided to stay back in Pacific Northwest. And then at OHSU, I mostly work in inpatient, not in consult setting, but I work in inpatient, straight inpatient setting. I worked in a, a neurogeriatric unit uh, where all my patients had a, a like mixed neurological problem and a psychiatric problem. So I worked with that specific population for four years. And I, at the side, I also did an integrative care CL model that is here at Oregon. So I used to be a consultant to the primary care doctors on an outpatient basis. So uh, also inpatient, I mean, it, anybody could consult us. It's a consult line statewide uh, for the whole state of Oregon uh, where any specialty like um, primary care or OBGYN or somebody from ICU, anybody could consult us uh, for a psychiatric consultation. So I did that for four years and then, then I decided to move to the more uh, less talked about part of CL because when we talk about CL, most people envision traditional inpatient CL to be the only option for their practice, but I really wanted you to know that there are other areas outside of inpatient setting where you can actually do a really good CL practice. So right now I work at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center or Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and I do full-time psychology work. And I really, really like psychology. And I think comparing between inpatient and psychology, I probably right now prefer psychology over inpatient traditional CL. Uh, the reason for that is, um, uh, so I, I was also, I mean, big fan of inpatient uh, traditional model of CL uh, when I trained uh, as a resident or after um, my residency and fellowship or for a very long time, even after that. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of complex cases in inpatient setting that needs a lot of help. Our colleagues, all the team members, they need a lot of help in figuring out complex situations uh, when patients are in inpatient. But I can tell you when they get discharged after a few days or a few weeks, that's where, that's where the factor lies, how successful they will be uh, in terms of their psychiatric treatment. So the outpatient support after getting discharged from the hospital is equally important for a holistic level of psychiatric treatment. And I really like that opportunity to work with cancer patients um, to go into the long-term treatment for them and discuss a lot of different things, not only medication, but also psychosocial uh, issues, but also existential issues and sometimes end of life issues and different other things. So overall, I would say CL psychiatry is almost the inevitable training in psychiatry you might want to consider if you really want to consolidate your training in psychiatry. Of course, there, an argument can be made that there is no need for a fellowship to practice CL. Probably there is not from a practice standpoint, but um, the fellowship definitely gives you the advantage of knowing the subject better and also having the breadth and the depth of knowledge in different areas of medicine, not only psychiatry, but different other areas and how they relate to psychiatry. That interface is very well taught and very well um, established in CL psychiatry training. I'm so happy to be here. And um, now I'm going to give it back to Kareem. And uh, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Can't believe I'm still doing that. Um, so we still, we still we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. So I did want to open the floor um, to any questions anybody has. Um, you're welcome to either unmute yourself or if you want to type it in the chat and um, I can read it as well. 
Um, I did actually I had someone message me. So um, I'm gonna read this question to the panel, um, but you're welcome to also just put it in the chat too. Um, so what are the prospects for CL psychiatry fellowships for IMGs in terms of eligibility or visas? I'm just going to answer the question, um, just thinking, assuming that it's for me. Um, see, um, a visa is definitely, it's a barrier in kind of pursuing a career in cell psychiatry. I would say that hands down, there is no, um, I mean, but there are different ways of working around that problem. So it's not that nobody is going to hire you in sales psychiatry if you are on a visa. You can still get a job. Uh, you can still practice sales psychiatry while being on a visa. I did. Um, I did my waiver and I also did a master's in clinical research while, while I was on visa. So, I mean, right now I'm not anymore, but when I did all of this, that time I was. Just make sure that you have a really good network of people. You join all the groups where uh, IMGs are there, I, early career psychiatry who are IMGs, or within ACLP, um, there is an ECP group where many people are IMGs. I know uh, a lot of them are IMGs. So stay in contact with them. And uh, there are universities who can actually do your J1 waiver after your training just that you have to be in touch with the chair of the department and sometimes you have to kind of go a little bit um, um kind of go be a little bit assertive and kind of explain them the visa situation universities are often unaware of the logistics of doing a visa not that they don't want to do but they're kind of unaware and they could be a little bit scared of the visa situation, but my OHSU did my visa and it was perfectly fine. As far as I know, I was the first waiver candidate for OHSU. So if you stay in contact with your uh, colleagues and also stay in contact with the chairs of the departments and you can get acquainted with them in SELP, especially during the poster sessions or brief oral presentation sessions um, like that. And if you have any specific personal question about navigating this situation, just uh, let me know. I will put my email ID in this chat. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, we did get another question here too. Uh, so we have, a, are there a particularly a particular things someone should look for in residencies if they are strongly considering uh, CL psychiatry? So I'll say, uh, so I was considering CL psychiatry at the time I was applying to residency, among other things, uh, but I really wanted to make sure that I had strong internal medicine training as an intern. And, and that was at least my starting place. Um, you know, having uh, rotations in an ICU, that was something that was important to me. Some people like to avoid something like that in the residency programs. And some psychiatry residency programs will advertise, oh, you have a really easy intern year, you don't really have to do much medicine. And so at what they thought was a, a feature, I, I found to be a, a less of a, an exciting prospect. Um, so I think that's something that I found uh, helpful looking uh, as I was looking around. And then also places that have a CL fellowship. Um, I mean, I, I think so many uh, programs do, uh, but it's certainly an advantage or faculty members that are a member that are members of the ACLP or are well represented. Um, you know, I almost wonder if Talene has some uh, thoughts about this as having just gone through the process and, and being interested in CL, but um, but having those conversations, getting involved early, and you know that link that's up on the screen, joining ACLP is an amazing place also to start, even if you don't end up doing a CL fellowship, even if you don't have a career in CL, uh, you'll find it's an incredibly warm and generous group of people who would be happy to sort of walk you through um, some of their personal experiences. Yeah, I'm not part of the panel, so I don't want to like take up a bunch of time, but I think too, just um, if a place had a CL fellowship, that was a really big bonus for me, just because I imagine you get better CL exposure, or if there's a lot of CL fellowships in the area, 
um, because you'll find that like there's a ton in the city, there's a ton in like Boston area, like uh, sometimes they're just more concentrated in certain areas. Um, So that was something I looked at too, just because you can network a little bit easier that way. But um, I don't want to take up too much time because we have a few more questions, but that was something too I wanted to add. Um, and then we had another question, um, and this got talked about a little bit, but it was essentially asking about the uh, utility of, um, you know, pursuing a uh, CL fellowship, whether or not like, you know, in a community setting or if you need it to do academics and things like that, um, because this person had kind of been told that you don't necessarily need a fellowship. I've been told that as well. Um, so if you guys can maybe expand on some of the benefits of that. Um, I would say just, you know, working in academics, I mean, I think at this point, if you want to work in a teaching hospital on CL service, you pretty much need to do the fellowship now. I think that's pretty much required. For community settings, um, it's not required, but I would say that CL psychiatry takes a very unique skill set um, that I think is a little bit hard to develop if you don't do the fellowship. Um, I mean, the good thing is it's not 100% required, but I think the fellowship year was the year of biggest growth for me in my entire education, just because the liaising part is so important. We do so much of you know team meetings, like running a team meeting about a, a difficult case we might need a guardian, or you know deciding how trying to establish an eating disorder protocol for a patient that's stuck on a medical floor. And those things like if, you know, in the, the training you get in residency, you get some of that, but in the fellowship, you dedicate time to it. And so I think personally, um, just the complete patients are getting more and more sick and more and more complex in the hospital. I don't know if those of you in the inpatient settings agree with that, but um, the, the advantage of the fellowship is, is, you know, you really get that experience to to um, have mentors help you through those incredibly difficult situations. And then when you practice, you know, in community settings, I think you would feel much more confident. But, you know, if you're in a, um, a you know, non-tertiary care center, you don't necessarily have to do the fellowship. I just, I just personally think at this point, it's really valuable, even if you're going into community settings. Yeah, for me, I think the two things are mentorship and professional network. I'm not from New York. And being able to do the fellowship here in a city that has a really rich history of consult liaison psychiatry, it really helped uh, with finding out what's what's happening, what it's like here to practice psychiatry, who the different people are, what the job opportunities might be, even above and beyond the incredible breadth and depth of training that I feel like I got, that I can't imagine having anything remotely like that uh, if I had just gone straight from residency to practice. Certainly you will see the, the patients, um, you know, you may see some quite complex patients and you'll have, have opportunities to learn, but it'll be on the job and you won't have that layer of supervision. Um, and the, the breadth will certainly be different based on what, that, uh, what the hospital is, is like or what that setting is like. Um, so yeah, mentorship in that professional network make a huge difference. People uh, kind of bounce cases off each other too uh, at various institutions. So you develop that during fellowship more than you might, or at least faster than you might if you didn't do it. I would also just add that if kind of the more you are in the community and isolated from other CL um, colleagues in your own hospital, I think the more valuable actually that training and mentorship would be. Um, so I'm actually the only full-time CL boarded psychiatrist on my um, practice, even though that we're in Boston and we have a part-time CL boarded attending. Um, and we, we commonly hire people who don't have fellowship experience, um, but we also need the people who are boarded to keep our educational programs up. And I really value my mentors um, in kind of how to teach those liaison aspects to people who don't have the same training. Thank you, everybody. Um, I did want to just quickly put in this last question um, that I got messaged, but somebody asked if it was uh, possible to incorporate child and adolescent psych with CL. Yeah, we, um, at our institution at Michigan Medicine, uh, we have a whole separate child and adolescent consultation liaison team. So some people go at that by doing the child fellowship, um, child and adolescent fellowship, and then um, they, they pick a child and adolescent fellowship that has a fair amount of CL training. Um, and then some people, I suppose, I don't know if you could go at it through doing the CL fellowship. I think probably you would more go at it doing 
the child and adolescent fellowship, maybe doing a CL fellowship after that, but that's a lot of training. So I think most people go at it doing child and adolescent and they would pick a fellowship program that is heavy on a CL experience. But our child CL colleagues are amazing and do wonderful work um, and do very similar work to what I do only with the children and adolescent population. So uh, a plug for Nasu Mollis and Jess Pierce here at Michigan Medicine for our child uh, fellowship program. Yeah, here at, at Columbia, we also have uh, folks who see the child consults as a, as a bit of a separate team. Um, I would also add that a, a colleague from residency, um, she actually ended up doing a pediatrics residency and then psychiatry and then child and adolescent psychiatry and she does CL um, having not done the CL fellowship but I, I think uh, uh, likely well qualified with that nice combination background. Okay so we have one more question. Um, I know it's uh, four o'clock so I did want to say that if um, anybody either attendees or panelists does have to run or anything like that feel free. Um, but we did have like one or two more questions. So if you do have time um, and are able to stay and want to answer them, um, obviously welcome to do that too. Um, but before anybody like logs out or anything, I did want to um, say that we have this like QR code here. Um, so joining the ACLP as a medical student is free. Um, and there's actually a lot of ways you can get involved. Um, I got involved as a fourth year on the medical student education subcommittee they have. Um, they have like mentorship programs and things like that. Um, so if you are interested in CL, it's definitely a really good idea to join and it's free. Um, is it, do we have time to ask uh, another question? I just wanna make sure to respect the panelists time too. And, um, okay, I'm seeing nodding. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm on call this weekend, so I will sign off, but uh, stay in touch uh, if anybody has any specific question. Thank you so much. It was such an honor having you and just really appreciate you taking time on a Saturday to come. Uh, thank you. Um, so I got this question that I think might be relevant for some students, but they said, uh, what are some important considerations for someone considering a combined training program like MedPsych or FM Psych versus doing CL fellowship, like a categorical psych uh, residency? Um, I don't have, so, so combined programs were not as much of a thing when I was in training and I was in mid-career. But we do actually, we did hire someone on our service, um, on our sales service who is combined med psych. So she went to the Duke program um, and really enjoyed it. Um, I think, I think it, you know, in that situation, if you're going to do a combined program, my sort of general feeling on it is that it makes most sense if you really want to legitimately practice in both settings. So she does um, half-time hospitalist internal medicine. Um, and it's kind of nice when she's on service, we don't get consulted as much because she manages the psych issues for some of her folks. Um, and then 50% time she actually does CL. Um, and she, so she didn't do the CL fellowship, but it makes sense in the sense that she's medicine boarded, right? Um, I think for me, I knew I did not want to kind of get into the details of like managing someone's diabetes or hypertension or, you know, I was really more interested in delirium, psychosis, depression, catatonia, um, you know, capacity, those types of things. And I liked being knowledgeable of the medical stuff, but I didn't want to be the one managing it. So, you know, for some people that are really struggling to decide and they really want to like, you know, be, you know, coming up with the differentials for the chest pain and, and, and managing those things and they want to maybe find a job that could do both. It is possible when my colleague does it. But um, for me, I think I, I, I think picking psychiatry, I was more interested in this, the psychiatry than I was um, the internal medicine or family medicine part of it. I would ag agree with all of those things. And yeah, I certainly, um, I, I think I considered a, a combined program kind of transiently. And I think it also depends on how much of, how much you wanna be kind of a, a broad generalist versus um, doing something more specific. One of the things that really appealed to me about psychiatry was being a specialist. And I think it gave me a little bit of pause because I think we all, not everyone, but I certainly went to medical school thinking, you know, it would be so great if I could, um, you know, go on a medical mission and walk into a town and, you know, if they didn't have a doctor, I could do anything. 
And I realized that that's actually just not even in my skill set to know in depth about so many different illnesses. And I think, you know, for my colleagues who do internal medicine and emergency medicine, I think it really is in their skill set, but it wasn't in mine. Um, so just kind of knowing yourself, do you want to, you know, know how to deliver babies for a combined family psych program? Um, and it's wonderful if you do, um, but if if that's something that you want to consult on and know a lot about, like Jeff mentioned, um, picking a training program where you can get more of those um, those in-depth medicine or off-service rotations um, is with neuro as well. Um, I think just kind of examining what your goals are um, in spending that extra year. And we also actually have a, a medicine site combined uh, faculty member with us and it's wonderful. He knows so much about, um, you know, whenever we have a hyponatremia patient, he can explain it to everyone um, in depth and really have that um, that experience of being a medicine attending. Um, but I do think it's it's just a slightly different bit than the liaison training you get in fellowship. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting with the people who I've known who have done the combined programs. It's like at, uh, they practice at, at, at almost like the extremes. Like I know some who have gone to very rural places where they're very under-resourced and are able to practice across a broad spectrum and provide services that other people wouldn't be able to and are kind of like this really major contributor to a, a high need community. And then on the fully other end of it, people who are highly uh, specialized, subspecialized, doing research and clinical care, um, oftentimes with a particular disease entity in mind um, that will do the combined programs and, and do that kind of research and clinical care. Um, particularly, I'm thinking of the people who have uh, dual trained in um, psychiatry and neurology that, that I know personally. Um, and so I think it's, it's really, if you can find the person who's doing the job that you wanna have one day and you say, you know what? That person was only able to do that because they had that combined program it might be for you. Otherwise, I, I think it's, you know, finding those mentors and, and kind of find, like figuring that out along the way. I will admit every once in a while, I'll see a, a patient in the ICU. I really like critical care psychiatry. And I think, oh gosh, should I go and just be a critical care, you know, an ICU attending? And I think, no way, that's not what I want to do at all. But it, it, there is this pull sometimes like, I really love this team. I really love that highly specialized care, the use of technology. But there are places you get that in psychiatry. And so I, I think making uh, making your way and figuring that out for yourself and good mentorship is the only way you can get there. OK, well, I think that's all the questions that I've been sent. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone, especially obviously our panelists. I know it's Saturday, so thank you for being here um, and just sharing all of your valuable insights. And a uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Um, you know, hopefully you guys had a you know great time and got to learn a lot. I know I did. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to, and good luck to everyone. And choose from your heart. <laughs> Thanks everyone. And thank you, Talene, for moderating this excellent panel. Yeah, thank you, Talene. And uh, send us all the emails if you have questions. Yeah, thanks for dealing with my technical difficulties. <laughs> thanks so much, Talene. This was great. And join the ACLP. Yeah. It's free. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, everybody join the ACLP. It's wonderful.